So today I want to talk a little bit about my story, founding Mercy for Animals, the work that we do to give farmed animals a voice on an international level, why animals even matter, and what the future of our food system can look like. So I guess you could say it makes sense that I would start an international animal rights organization, given the fact that I was actually delivered by a veterinarian. My, my dad, Mark, um, who you see illegally driving around <laughs> with me um, in this photograph, was a veterinarian, uh, graduated from OSU. And I was born on the couch at home in a village of less than 2,000 people in rural Ohio. So I was slated to be a fifth generation farmer. But my love for animals and fasc fascination for animals would lead me on a very different path. Now they say that big lessons can come in small packages and that was definitely the case for me. And that little package was a rat named Caesar. Uh, when I was six years old, I went across the cornfields from our house to uh, a, a couple whose name was Jean and Sylvia, and they actually raised animals for research in laboratories. They raised rabbits, mice, rats, and guinea pigs, and they rented the property from my parents. And one afternoon when I went over there with my mom to collect that month's rent check, Sylvia asked if I wanted to see the animals because she knew of my deep love for them, and I said, Yes, of course, she took me inside of the sheds. And now I really look back in horror at what I saw there. These animals crammed in tiny cages, dead animals in the corners, the smell of ammonia. She reached into one of the cages and pulled this white rat out by his tail and lowered him into my hands. And I begged her to allow me to take him home. And she said yes, my mother said yes. And I named this little guy Caesar. And he became my best friend for about two and a half years. He would sit on my shoulder as I went around the house. He knew his name. He would come calling when he would come running when I called him. And I realized just how intelligent and social these animals are, how they have their own unique personalities. But Caesar also taught me about the prejudices that humans bring to the table with certain animals. And he started to peel back the layers of my own view as a young child about what separates animals that we consider to be pests from those that we consider to be pets and those that we consider friends and those that we consider food. I would take friends and friends parents to see Caesar, and so many of them would shriek in horror and disgust, saying, ooh, a rat, look at his tail. They didn't know him as an individual as I did. They were judging Caesar for what he was, not who he was. I started to realize from Caesar that when it comes to having personalities and minds and interests and a spark for life, that all animals are really equal, and the difference is only our perception of them. About six years later, another big life-changing lesson came in also a small package, and that was a baby piglet. My local high school in this farming community had an agriculture class, and the teacher of that class, Mr. Jenkins, was a pig farmer. And it came time in the curriculum where they were going to do a dissection project, and Mr. Jenkins decided that he would kill some baby piglets on his farm. He raised over 10,000 pigs, a large operation. He arrived one May morning in 1999 with this bucket of piglets to the classroom. And when he got there, one of the piglets was still alive. A student in the class who did part-time work on Mr. Jenkins' farm walked over to the bucket, picked up this piglet by her hind legs, and slammed her head first into the ground. Now, this piglet, which you see right here in these photographs, didn't die. She was determined to survive. Her skull was fractured. She was bleeding out of her mouth. She was vocalizing in distress. A few students who were just absolutely appalled by what they had witnessed grabbed this now dying animal, left the classroom, went down the hallway to Molly Fearing's classroom, another teacher in the school who was known as being the vegetarian who cared about animals. She left the school, went to a local veterinarian, and had this poor piglet euthanized. There was nothing they could do to help her. Molly's next stop was the local sheriff's department, where she filed an animal cruelty complaint, asking that charges be brought, and they were. The very first day of that trial, however, 
the cruelty charges were dismissed. And that's because in Ohio, like most states, if something is considered standard agricultural practice, it's exempt from cruelty prosecution. And the practice of slamming baby piglets headfirst into the ground is considered standard agricultural practice. It's known as thumping in the pork industry. It is considered a cheap and effective way of killing animals. Now this case, to me, as a 15-year-old illustrated that there needed to be an organization in my local farming community that would advocate on behalf of these animals. It was clear to me, had this been a puppy or a kitten, the outcome would have been completely different. The cruelty charges would have stuck and the, the teacher would have been referred for psychiatric evaluation, perhaps banned from ever having animals again. But because it was a pig, the outcome was very different. So I started Mercy for Animals. We had no money, no resources. I had no idea what I was doing, but I had a passion to right a wrong and give a voice to these animals who suffer. Today, Mercy for Animals works in four main program areas. The first, undercover investigation, sending people into factory farms and slaughterhouses wired with pinhole-sized hidden cameras to document what takes place behind the closed doors of industrial factory farms, hatcheries, livestock auctions, when the industry doesn't think that it is being watched. And I'll talk more about that later. We also work through legal advocacy, changing laws, pushing on a federal level, but also on a state level, to outlaw the worst factory farm practices through corporate outreach, pushing the largest corporations in this country, everyone from Walmart to McDonald's, to also abandon the cruelest factory farm practices. And finally, through consumer education and awareness campaigns, informing people on the fact that animals are individuals with unique minds and personalities, their lives matter, the treatment of them matters, and that our food choices also matter, and moving towards a vegan diet, moving away from animals and towards plants. This incident taught me at a young age that we all have power. Just the fact that we are born human puts us in a place of power. To be in a time and in a country where we are able to, freak, to speak freely also gives us power. And Mercy for Animals has been one of the most empowering experiences of my life, being able to advocate on those who have no voice. Dr. King once said that our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. So I want to talk about people who are using their place of power to help animals and speak out about things that matter. One such individual is Dr. Jane Goodall. Now she says, we have to understand that we are not the only beings on this planet with personalities and minds. Now, most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the work of Dr. Goodall, who spent over 40 years living with and observing chimpanzees in Africa. Now, she started to do this work at a time when even the veterinary community was not united in the belief and understanding that all animals felt physical pain, let alone that they had rich intellectual and emotional lives. It was through Dr. Goodall's work that we started to understand that many of the false barriers and walls that we put up between us and other animals were in fact non-existent. She witnessed and documented animals having culture, having language, using tools, grieving for the loss of loved ones. This is an image that I think really shows friendship and loyalty and love. These are two dogs in China. Now, they were street dogs. They never had a human companion. They were never given names by people. But to each other, they meant everything. One afternoon, the female was hit and she was killed by a car. Her loyal companion stayed by her side for hours on end, licking her face, nudging her, dodging traffic to comfort her. This is, of course, just one example of that bond. And we live in a country where half of us share our homes with dogs and cats. And of those animals, half of them will receive gifts this holiday season. We spend billions of dollars on their care and toys and medical procedures. Yet we live in a country where billions, literally billions of animals, suffer and die the worst fate imaginable. And those, of course, are farmed animals. 
And part of what Mercy for Animals does is help to bridge the gap in our empathy and our understanding of animals, to widen our circle of compassion, to include those that for all too long have simply been labeled food. This is another image that tells a story of love. This image is from India. This mother cow's baby was hit and killed by a bus. For two years, she stayed in the same area, and every time that the bus that hit and killed her baby came by, she would slowly walk along it in front of it as if trying to prevent the bus from killing any other animals. Now, the bus driver became so frustrated by this that he actually painted the bus trying to disguise it and fool this mother cow. But she wasn't fooled. She remembered the face of the man who drove the bus that killed her baby. So this, of course, shows not only emotional empathy, but also a prolonged memory as well. Now, of course, animals tell us so much if we will just bother to listen and watch and observe. And oftentimes, science is slow to catch up with what that would tell us. But finally, that is happening. Just a few years ago, hundreds of the leading scientists signed the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness. And what this says is that all animals are just as conscious and aware as humans. And we're not just talking about mammals. We're talking about birds, fish, and even octopus. This is a headline just from the last week that appeared in the New York Times. Fish depression is not a joke. Talking about depression in fish in captivity, where they are kept in enclosures with no stimulation. So much so that fish are being used to study antidepressants. This article from Smithsonian, Fido make, Fido's making that puppy face on purpose. He's trying to tell you something. And of course, this all makes sense. When we think about our singular place of life forming, of evolution beginning, it makes sense that other animals would remember faces of friends and foes. It helps with their survival. Bonding and empathy also helps with their survival. Not to mention, of course, physical pain being necessary for their survival. But we have grown so disconnected. We start to view ourselves as different from other animals, separate from. But only 70,000 years ago, there were at least six species of humans on this earth. Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Denisovans, and others. But about 10,000 years ago, things started to change as we domesticated plants and animals in the Neolithic period and we started agriculture. We became stationary rather than hunter-gatherers. And with that, we built walls, literal walls, between us and the natural world and our animal cousins. <coughs> and that agriculture that once sustained us and allowed us to start civilization as we know it and human history as we know it has gone completely awry leading to factory farms, other animals not being viewed as sentient creatures, but as production units, as machines, as resources. And I believe that we must shift and have an ethical evolution that encompasses animals. And I think that this quote from The Economist sums up that march forward well. It says, historically, man has expanded the reach of his ethical calculations as ignorance and wants have receded first beyond family and tribe, later beyond religion, race, and nation. Bringing other species more fully into the range of these decisions one day may seem no more than civilized behavior requires. And we are starting to see this ethical march forward in our treatment of animals and our understanding of animals. After over 130 years of confining elephants, of ripping them from their families, capturing them in the wild, of beating tigers, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, citing declining attendance and new legal restrictions against their acts, has permanently shut down. And we are starting to see an increased awareness of the problems of keeping orcas and dolphins in confinement at places like SeaWorld. And I predict in the next few years, we will see similar announcements from SeaWorld and similar aquatic parks that will also retire these animals to oceanside sanctuaries. 
This just from the last few weeks. California puppy mill ban will require pet stores to sell rescue animals. California becoming the first state in the nation to ban the sale of dogs in puppy, from puppy mills in pet stores, taking effect in January 2019. So there is a march forward in our treatment of animals. But when we talk about animals, we're really talking about farmed animals. Though they are the most absent, the most invisible from our scenario. We don't go home to a pig, most of us. We don't share our homes with them, but most of us don't know them as individuals. But as this chart shows, they really are the 99%. The yellow showing the number of farmed animals used in this country. The blue, animals in labs, gray shelters, and in black clothing. Nearly 9 billion in the US every year, that's about 300 every second. We're looking at hundreds of billions on an international level when we include aquatic life, which of course we should. And this is what most people really know about factory farming, <laughs> very little. And that is by design. Obviously, there is so much money pumped into portraying this false image that happy meat comes from happy animals. We are told from children that hamburgers grow in hamburger patches at McDonald's. And there is a concerted effort by the meat industry to keep people in the dark. In fact, criminalize even taking photographs inside of factory farms and slaughterhouses, further pulling the curtain closed. But at Mercy for Animals, we believe that people have a right to know where their food comes from, that animals have a right to have their stories told. And that's why we carry out undercover investigations. And I talk about this at length in my book, but I want to tell you just a little bit about who these incredible individuals are. On the left here is Pete. Pete is the most prolific undercover investigator that the American animal rights movement has ever seen. He has been to over 400 puppy mills. He's been inside of dozens of factory farms and slaughterhouses and now does investigations on an international level. Liz, who you see here in the middle, used to work at an animal sanctuary, but she knew that if she left behind her friends and family and did undercover investigations, she would be able to help even more animals, and so she did that. In fact, her work at Butterball Turkey led to the first ever felony conviction for cruelty to factory farm birds. And on the right is Cody, who is a former investigator who has worked at the largest dairy farm in New York, leading to criminal animal cruelty convictions and international policy change, and at a pig factory farm in Pennsylvania. And I want to tell you a story from his work there. On his first day at this breeding facility where pigs are kept locked in tiny crates where they can't turn around, Cody opened the shed door and stepped inside. And he saw mother pigs with their babies in farrowing crates. But he noticed that one of the cage doors was open and the mother was in the hallway with her baby piglets behind her. And as he investigated more, he realized that in fact two other sows were also free from their cage and their piglets following behind. Cody asked other workers what had happened. They did some investigating and they determined that the one mother sow had figured out how to use her tongue to unlatch a pin in the cage door and liberate herself and then free her piglets behind her. But she didn't stop there. She opened the cage doors of other suffering pigs around her. Now they say that the definition of love is having a benevolent and unselfish concern for the good of another. If this isn't an act of love, I don't know what is. It certainly is a lacked, a, an act of bravery and courage. Now how was she repaid for this? She was shot in the head with a captive bolt gun. The farm says that once pigs learn how to free themselves, they will continue to do it time and time again. So that's just one story of the bravery and courage that's happening right now inside of factory farms. We talk about the physical pain that animals endure, and we should, but there's also emotional distress that these animals are subjected to as well. 
At Mercy for Animals, we focus on doing the most good that we can. We realize that we have limited time, resources, and energy. So we want to help as much as we possibly can, save as many lives, reduce as much suffering. So in our campaigns and in our work, we look at the number of animals affected, the duration of suffering, the degree of suffering, and where there are viable alternatives. And while we push forward for a vegan world, and I'll talk more about that, we also believe that it's our ethical obligation to prevent as much suffering as we can for the animals unfortunate enough to be born now and in the future. So part of that includes changing laws and pushing for policy changes, as I mentioned before. And we look at the internationally accepted five freedoms as a base for that work. And that's freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom from fear and distress, and freedom to express normal behavior. Simple terms, but vast impact. That means addressing the intensive confinement of animals, like those mother pigs that I just told you about, and ending gestation crates ending the confinement of egg-laying hens in battery cages, file cabinet-sized cages where five to seven birds are kept for their entire lives, unable to spread their wings, walk, perch, roost, does bathe, or engage in the most basic natural behaviors. It means ending the confinement of baby calves inside of veal crates. And we're having success. We have pushed many of the largest players, everyone from Walmart to McDonald's, to address these abuses. Now, this doesn't mean that these animals live happy lives. And in fact, many of these commitments have phase in periods of 10 years or more. But it is moving the ball forward, showing that these animals' lives matter and that the treatment of them during those lives matter. Our main focus right now is on birds used for meat, broiler chickens, literally named after the cooking method. These are birds that have been bred to be almost Frankenstein animals, bred to grow so large and so fast that they're killed when they're 45 days old. Babies. And they suffer under the weight of their own bodies. There's not a single federal law that provides protection to animals during their lives on factory farms. And the only federal laws that do exist are related to the final moments of the animal's lives, transport and slaughter. And of that, they exempt birds, which make up the 95% of farmed animals. So the way in which chickens are killed in this country that's considered standard and legal would be illegal if it was a dog or a cat and a cow or a pig. So we're working to change that as well. These birds are dumped out of uh, crates, snapped into shackles. They have their throats slit while they're fully conscious, oftentimes, and many of them go into scalding tanks of water while they're still alive. The USDA says at least a million birds a year, but we know that the number is, in fact, much higher. So we're working to reduce the suffering of these birds through pressuring companies to change the genetics of these birds, give them natural light, enrichment, so that they have something to do during their miserable existence, reduce stocking density, and change slaughter practices. And in just the last year, we've been able to pressure over 100 of the largest food companies in the world to make these changes, affecting over 1 billion birds. But we're also addressing this on the political front. Now, there's no clear roadmap right now for federal legislation that would protect animals. So we have to look at the state level. Half of the states don't even have ballot initiative processes, but California does. And we are part of a coalition that is launching right now an initiative that would end the cage confinement of birds, cows, and pigs in California, but also the sale of meat and eggs from birds that are kept in these enclosures. So if you're interested, please go to preventcruelty.ca.com to get involved in that initiative. These efforts are having a real impact, as I said, impacting over 1 billion animals year wide. One dollar to MFA helps 111 animals reduce the suffering of these, these animals through policy changes and spares one animal from ever being born into factory farms. This is our view of effective altruism. How can we stretch the dollar to impact the most animals? Though again, we won't meet these animals, but prevention goes so far in helping them. We also believe that where an animal is born or where an animal hatches 
shouldn't dictate whether they live lives of suffering or whether they have respect. We believe that a pig in China and a pig in the US deserve the same sort of consideration, that a chicken in Canada or a chicken in Mexico deserve the same consideration. And while we make progress here in the United States, the truth is, is that only about 2% of farmed animals are in the US. The other 98% are on a global level, about half of this in China. And this includes fish that are farmed. And unfortunately, we are seeing an increase in meat consumption and production on a global scale. In fact, it is estimated that by 2050, global meat production will double. So we need to come up with innovative ways to address this, which I'll talk about a bit later. One way in which we're doing this is by launching offices and campaigns around the globe. We now have a presence in six countries, together representing over half of the global human population. These are slides of investigations that we carried out in Mexico at over a dozen government-owned slaughterhouses. And we documented pigs having their hearts cut open while still alive, being electrically shocked, uh, hammers being used to kill adult cows and steers. Now we used this investigation to push for federal legislation. And I'm excited to say that it is moving through the Mexico legislature as we speak. In just the last week, it passed the equivalent of the House in Mexico, and it is now going before the Senate. And we are optimistic that it will pass and be signed by the president. And what this piece of legislation does is make it a crime to slit the throat of animals while still conscious in slaughterhouses. Currently, it is not illegal to do so in Mexico. But we're also addressing this at the core, which is consumer demand for meat, dairy, and egg products. Now, we have a lot of consumer education campaigns that go directly to consumers, but we also are doing institutional meat reduction work. And a lot of this is in Latin America, where we work with schools to carry a vegan meal, the only meal that they carry one day a week, completely vegan. And just since launching this program a few months ago, we've had over a dozen successes leading to a total of 25 million vegan meals a year being served through these schools. Planet Earth, our one precious home, shared with our fellow Earthlings, connected and alike through this shared experience called life, through love, companionship, joy, family, and a desire to be free. But we've lost our way and betrayed the animals. We have abused our power. We have dominated and hurt our fellow Earthlings. We have locked them in cages and condemned them to death. Hearts broken. Families separated. Unseen. Unheard. We must turn the tide toward kindness and compassion. It is up to us to expose the truth confront cruelty, give a voice to the voiceless, and change the world for them, for all of us. Together, we can inspire compassion, stop the violence, and bring about a revolution of love. Together, we can create a world without cages, a world without factory farming or slaughterhouses. A world without cruelty. A world where our fellow Earthlings are free again. To build this compassionate future, we must act today.
So how do we build this compassionate future? Um, to do that, I want to start by talking about Henry Ford. Um, you know, if we look about 100 years ago, the streets were crowded with horses, overworked horses that were pulling carriages in the blistering heat and the freezing temperature. And there were people advocating on behalf of these horses and the better treatment of them. But what truly changed the game was something better, faster, more efficient. And that was, of course, the Model T. History is crowded with examples of this. We can look at what helped drive down the whaling industry. And yes, it was international outcry, but it was also kerosene and other forms of oil. If we look at what's happening right here in Silicon Valley, how innovation is changing the way in which people travel, where they stay, how they gather information, we can see that simple ideas can change the world. And I believe that animal agriculture is ripe for this type of disruption. Not only is it inhumane, but it is completely inefficient. We think about the amount of grain and energy that has to be used to produce that grain, to funnel it through animals to get a small amount of meat. It doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. As we race towards a global population of 9.7 billion by 2050, we simply can't grow and feed enough animals to raise, to, to, to feed the growing population. Now, Richard Branson recently said, I believe that in 30 years or so, we will no longer need to kill any animals and that all meat will either be clean or plant-based, taste the same and also be much healthier for everyone. And Mr. Branson is a new investor in Memphis Meats, a company that was founded by Uma Valetti, who is a cardiologist. He was saving lives in hospitals, and he realized that in the medical profession, they were growing tissues for quite some time for medical purposes. And he thought, can't we use this same technology to raise meat, meat without the murder? something that Google has been at the forefront of, with Sergey Brin, of course, funding the first lab-grown burger from Mark Post just a number of years ago. Now, Uma started Memphis Meats, and it's called Memphis Meats because one of his co-founders is from Memphis and actually owns and runs barbecue meat restaurants there and would like to have clean meat to be able to serve in his restaurants one day. Now, Uma and his team have created the world's first clean meatball, but also the world's first clean chicken and duck products just in the last few years. And it is called clean meat as a nod to clean energy. It takes about 50% less energy to produce clean meat and produces about 90% less greenhouse gas emissions, requires 90% less land and uh, um, water as well. But it's also called clean meat because it is literally cleaner to produce in bioreactors and uh, much the same way that beer is produced. So you're not going to find the same levels of bacteria contamination, E. coli, Salmonella, Camelobacter, etc. This chart uh, shows Memphis meats, uh, uh, antibiotic and bacteria levels compared to conventional and organic levels. It's pretty clear. The Guardian's headline sums it up. They said, lab-grown food, the goal is to remove the animal from meat production. And Uma considers this the second domestication. The first domestication 10,000 years ago, the Neolithic period, which I mentioned before. <coughs> this being cellular agriculture, a reflection of not only our ethical evolution, but also our increased understanding of science and being able to cut animals out of the equation and get right to the heart of the matter. I believe so firmly in the ability for clean meat and plant-based meat to revolutionize the way that we eat and in the process eliminate factory farming that I helped start the Good Food Institute, which you heard a little bit about before. This is a nonprofit that supports the entire plant-based and clean meat sector by uh, supporting scientists and technology, innovation, and policy work, making sure that when clean meat comes to market, that it won't face any legal hurdles and community engagement. 
also starting new crop capital, putting our money where our mouth is, doing angel seed investing in companies that are high risk but have the potential to change the world, investing in companies like Memphis Meats, Beyond Meat, Lyrical Foods, uh, Good Catch, companies that are seeking to create vegan plant-based alternatives to fish. We are racing towards having a fishless ocean by 2048 with most of the wild stocks in severe decline. This is a moral and ethical issue as much as it is a conservation and environmental issue as well. And we have good company with these investments that we are making, perhaps unusual, you might think. Um, the Tyson Food CEO says that the future of food might be meatless, reflecting a 5% investment that they recently did in Beyond Meat. Cargill, one of the largest meat companies in the U.S., recently did an investment alongside Bill Gates and others in Memphis Meats itself. This is something that I welcome. You know, just as the, the car changed the transportation sector, we believe that plant-based and clean meat can change the protein sector. So we want companies in the protein sector to embrace this, make this part of their business plan. And we are seeing that happen at an alarmingly great rate. Now I want to talk a little bit about change over time. Just a few years ago, people would say clean meat, ending factory farming. This is crazy talk. It's never going to happen. This is too deeply ingrained in our culture and in our beliefs. But a little bit of historical perspective, I think, can show how quickly things can change. Dr. King once said that the arc of the moral universe is long but bends towards justice. And this is true. And our history books are filled with examples of this. But that arc of the moral universe, it doesn't bend on its own. It doesn't bend because of the weight of time. It bends because thoughtful, committed, concerned people step up to the plate and they take action. Whether that's protesting, speaking out, founding organizations, supporting organizations, or being innovators in the space. Just 150 years ago, we ended slavery in this country. Con owning another human being, considering them as chattel and property. 97 years ago, women were finally given the right to vote. There were impassioned debates in Congress about women being too irrational of creatures to be able to vote. Funny considering the situation today. <laughs> Just 53 years ago, we ended segregation in this country, something that was fought tooth and nail. Just 50 years ago, in Loving versus Virginia, interracial marriage was legalized across the United States, striking down certain state laws that made it a crime. People were arrested in their ho own homes because of who they loved. And just two years ago, my love and others in the LGBT community finally recognized in our country on a national level with the Supreme Court decision. Now, when I grew up on a farm in Ohio, I was called a faggot before I knew what the word even meant. And I was taught and told by society that my love wasn't equal. And I can tell you, at a young age, there were many times when I thought that I would never be able to get married, that society would never progress to a point where that would happen. And I can only imagine when people like Rosa Parks were being dragged off of buses that they probably didn't know when or if they would see those changes in their lifetime. But they pushed forward, and society is better because of it. Nelson Mandela, who was a political prisoner, released and became the president of South Africa, once said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And then it seems inevitable. And again, we can look at history books and we can say, of course slavery would end. Of course women would be given the right to vote. Of course segregation would end. But again, it didn't happen on its own. Now, Peter Singer, author of Animal Liberation and many other wonderful books, once said, it's easy for us to criticize the prejudices of our grandfathers from which they freed themselves from their fathers. But it is more difficult for us to dispassionately search for prejudices in our own beliefs and I believe that animal protection, animal rights, is a social justice issue. 
And if we look at the number of individuals that are suffering and the degree to which they are suffering, I think it is one of the most pressing social justice issues. And it is different from other past movements in the sense that those who are being oppressed and marginalized, they can't speak up on their own behalf. They can't stand up here and share their stories. They can't lobby Congress to pass laws. They can't organize boycotts. They rely on each and every one of us to do that on their behalf in our own unique and meaningful ways. But if we stop for a moment and we look and we listen, we see that these animals are protesting. They are struggling. They are trying to save their own lives and oftentimes the lives of others that they care about. This is an image from China of a brave pig who jumped out of the top of a moving transport truck on her way to slaughter to save her own life. And it seems like every few weeks, every few months, we see stories in the paper of animals who jumped over fences to save themselves from slaughter. And when that happens, everyone rallies behind those animals. They want them to be saved. They want them to go to sanctuaries. Each animal deserves that. I just want to share this story, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. It's a little boy is at the beach with his grandfather. And there are hundreds of starfish that have washed up along the shore. And the little boy is tossing them back into the water, one after the next. And his grandfather looks at him and says, what are you doing? There are maybe thousands of starfish here. You can't possibly save them all. And the little boy smiles back at his grandfather. He reaches down, he picks up another starfish and gently tosses him back into the water. And he said, it matters to this one. And he reaches back down, picks up another one, puts him back in the water and says, and it matters to this one. And to me, this story really illustrates the power that we have to save lives, to prevent cruelty, to improve the world. And how any act of kindness is never wasted. In little choices that we make, maybe it's the food choices that we make, can have profound consequences for animals. It can be the difference between life or death. So I'll leave you with this quote from Harriet Beecher Stowe. She said, it's a matter of taking the side of the weak against the strong, something the best people have always done. And it is difficult to imagine a group of individuals who are weaker and more vulnerable than animals. And within that group, farmed animals. So thank you for being here and for being on the side of the weak and vulnerable. Do we have time for questions? So we, we see things like happy feet, where an animal communicates with mm. uh, the world, and we all take note. Um, yeah. But I feel like they communicate with us all of the time. Absolutely. So what prevents us from connecting our emotions that we have for our pets with all of the other animals that we see in the world? What, I know some of it is a bit of brainwashing, but what <clears throat> inherently is preventing us from making that connection? I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, on this sort of brainwashing, um, Melanie Joy uh, has written a book. Uh, well, she's written three books. Um, one is called Why We uh, Eat eat pigs, wear cows, and love dogs. Um, and she talks about carnism, which is this invisible belief that uh, allows us to eat some animals but not others. And the truth is that we don't eat most animal species. It's actually a very small um, you know, number, cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, um, ducks. Uh, and it really is a, a belief system um, that, that allows us to, to do that. I think that part of it is that it is social conditioning um, it, that is reinforced all the time. And we don't know that we're being conditioned in that way. It starts at a very young age, especially in you know, the United States and, and Western cultures. Um, so I think part of it is that these animals are sort of ghosts in our industrial machine. People don't see them. You, know, you go to the grocery store and you pick up a package of meat and it doesn't resemble an animal. And we call it beef or we call it pork. Um, so I think that's a big part of it, is people are able to have willful ignorance, that they don't want to know about something, so they're not going to. Um, and I think that that 
is 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 one of the driving um, forces. And there's just also just so many social norms. You know, people don't even realize that they're making a choice so much. Um, so I think that that's one of the the most important things is as plant-based eating, as vegan eating becomes more mainstream um, and people see others doing it and it becomes a default option, that will um, that will go a long way. But part of what we want to do with the Good Food Institute, for example, is th the three main factors for people when they're eating is convenience, taste, and price. So we want to make the, the compassionate choice the default choice so that maybe we don't need to win over everyone's hearts and minds, but they can simply go to a store and that's what they're eating. And maybe it's clean meat and it's real meat. It's just produced in a different way. Um, so I think that that's, that's really exciting, and I think honestly, the way that we're we're going to drive down consumption as quickly as we can. Yeah, thank you. Do you have a list or some sort of resource where um, you know you have meat producers uh, that do use humane processes today? We don't. So I mean, Mercy for Animals is never going to endorse a meat company. I mean, like I said, we we think the only compassionate choice is a plant-based diet, but. We, we, as I said before, we believe that it's our obligation to prevent as much suffering as possible. So that means pushing companies away from, from those practices. So we don't have a list of companies that we endorse, and we never will. Um, but you know, there are different labeling programs that are used, um, and people who aren't yet ready to go completely plant-based, I think the best thing you can do is eat less meat. I think a lot of people will think, hey, I'm, I don't identify as vegan. I don't think I ever could. That's okay. You know, if everyone went meatless on Monday, a billion fewer animals would be killed. Um, and if people start moving in that direction, it's better. So people, especially as they're starting, shouldn't view this as an all or nothing because when people do that, oftentimes they do nothing. Um, and we need people to make uh, choices that, that help animals. Um, but the labels that are thrown around are, can be so deceptive. For example, there's the American Humane Association, which uh, certifies foster farms, chicken, and butterball. It's essentially a completely meaningless program. It really just rubber stamps what the industry is already doing. And we, we've seen this with the egg industry. Uh, a few years ago, they started animal care certified labeling, which meant they took one bird out of each cage. That's it. Um, the Better Business Bureau got involved. They said this is misleading, so they changed it to United Egg Producer Certified. So the industry knows that people care about this. So there's a lot of humane washing that's happening. Um, so if, if you are going to, to choose to eat these products, I think at the very least you should know what the labels mean because they can vary so much. Um, and you just would need to do um, your own research on that. I know that there is um, a, a Farm Forward, an organization that, that works um, on, on uh, animal welfare issues for food, has a, a website I think called buyingpoultry.com where they, um, you know, try to aggregate that information in one place for people. Yeah. Have you faced any sort of resistance from the meat industry? Have there been any instances of uh, kind of resistance from them? No, they love they love me. <laughs> 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 We're best friends. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, of course. Uh, so I think a number of things. One is they are trying to make it a crime for us to do investigations. So around 2011, a new wave of ag gag bills uh, uh, were introduced. Agriculture gag bills, a term um, coined by Mark Bittman, who was at the New York Times at the time. Um, these bills come in three sort of flavors. Some of them are outright ban on video and photographs. Others relate to job applications. Others relate to turning all of your footage over to law enforcement and no one else. Um, but these have been heavily pushed by the meat industry and the dairy industry has been very much behind them. So that's um, one, of, one of the big uh, pushbacks from the industry. Um, but each company is different, I will say. I mean, every company is run by individuals, so they have their own culture. And some companies, including meat companies, when we've done investigations, have responded um, by saying, yes, there is a problem here. Let's talk about what some solutions are that we could implement that would make things better. So, um, so that is, that is one, one outcome. Uh, others, like Tyson and, and like Cargill, like I said, um, while they're still doing horrible things for the animals they're raising are 
investing um, in these alternatives, which is smart. I mean, you look at the energy sector and the smart ones are investing in, in green energy. You can either choose to fight and change um, progress or you can jump on board and be a champion for it. So I think we're seeing more and more of that. Um, and I, I think that we will continue to see that trend. Um, again, these are companies that really view themselves as protein companies. You know, they're not in the business of just torturing animals. That's the old way of doing things, and they're doing it as efficiently as they feel that they can. But um, I think that there really won't be much of a choice but to move in, in this direction. Just the, the planet won't be able to survive without it. So I have a question from Menohar. What is being done to make sure that Tyson, et cetera, will not gain enough shares of these meatless ventures to prevent them from succeeding, or to own the patents, intellectual property, et cetera, or to negatively control the activities of these ventures? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, this is something that, so I'm, I'm not too concerned about them trying to put these places out of business. Again, I think the the business case for this is very strong it is it can be far more efficient so again they're in the protein space they're not you know committed to just continuing to slaughter animals and if you look through the history um, of let's say plant-based meat alternatives Gardein was recently purchased for 150 million dollars by pinnacle foods um, that's actually increased their distribution. That's actually gotten them into more places, larger advertising budgets. Um, you know, we, we've seen this with a lot of uh, silk and other dairy alternatives. Um, they're being purchased by dairy companies and they're not trying to shelve those or push them away. They're actually increasing their sales. Um, you know, these are for-profit businesses. They wanna make money where it can happen. So um, I'm not too, too concerned about that, um, but you know, the, the owners of those companies, I'm sure, are, are keeping an eye on it. I mean, if you look at, at the, the innovators in this space, many of them are mission driven. You know, they want to help animals and the environment as well. How are you working in the health area with information that can help people stop eating meat without fear of malnutrition, et cetera? Yeah, so this is, this is a great question. You know, we, we do touch some on health more in the, there's sort of, uh, two approaches. We, we need to talk about the why people should change their diet, but we also need to equally talk about the how people should change their diet. Because if not, you get a lot of people who agree in theory that plant-based eating is, is good, but they don't know how to do it. Um, so a lot of our education work is done in providing people with just the simple meal plans and how to be healthy and all of that. So that's a big part of, of those programs. We are an animal protection organization, however, so we're not a, a health organization, so that's not our primary focus. That's not really where our expertise and credibility comes in, but there are organizations that are doing that, like Physicians C Committee for Responsible Medicine. There are incredible resources and books, uh, Dr. Gregor, How Not to Die, things like that. So we do direct people um, in, in those ways as well. But yeah, I mean, we want, uh, we want people on a vegan diet to be healthy um, because you're going to be more likely to stay with the diet. You know, recidivism is so high um, with veganism. A lot of that is just um, a so social element. Um, people don't realize the social impact that going vegan can have, and so they want to sort of get back into the social graces of people. Um, so, so that is a part of what we do. People can go to chooseveg.com. We have a lot of health information there. Do you have any pointers on how to talk to kids, and specifically, other people's children? Because kids usually have questions, like, why don't you eat that? And the honest answer of, you know, I don't eat cows is a very enlightening experience for children. I don't have any kids. I do have three nieces um, who are all self-declared vegetarian or vegan, um, including my middle niece, Bella, who uh, puts her allowance money towards a pig at Animal Place that she's adopted. Um, so she goes and, and sees this pig. Um, look, I think I think kids are much brighter than a lot of people give them credit for, and I think that they can understand these concepts much better than people give them credit for. Um, and I think that that the default for, for kids and humans is to be compassionate and have empathy for animals. Um, I don't think that I was unique in my interest in animals growing up on a farm. In fact, I saw that with all of my friends who were in 4-H, and they would raise pigs and cows for slaughter and they would give these animals names and they would bottle feed them and they would stay up at night with them if they were sick and then they would sell them by the pound to go to slaughter and 
every single one of those kids essentially was heartbroken and would cry and would want to save that animal that year. But then as the years go on, they're just told that's the way it is. That's what these animals are here for. We have to do this. And you could sort of slowly see kids becoming desensitized and changing their view on it. So I, I don't have really specific advice on this, um, but I think, I think it needs to be appropriate given the age. I think, you know, really young kids, we probably um, can talk to them in a way that doesn't involve, uh, you know, gory slaughterhouse footage, um, and that would probably go over better. But I, I think that we can talk to kids about animals having personalities, and if they have a dog or a cat, um, that pigs and cows are exactly the same. I think they can understand that concept. I think it becomes challenging when parents aren't supportive of that because then you have kids that get it, but they can't get food if their parents aren't supportive. Um, and in and, and that way, I think it's important to have meaningful conversations with parents as well um, and encourage them to support you know, the children's sort of um, curiosity about this. But, you know, that's easier said than done, perhaps, sometimes. <laughs> Hi, um, Hi. This question isn't really for me. I've been vegetarian or vegan um, for 30 years. Wow. I think it's just, it's been awesome for me. I feel, you know, like I have great energy and um, it's been amazing. Um, clean meat, um, I would never eat it. I would never try it. I don't miss meat. I don't want to ever have meat. But um, what are the ethical dimensions, uh, you know, maybe for some people who are vegetarian uh, or vegan? Yeah. Well, I can personally, I don't care if vegetarians or vegans eat clean meat. It's really not for vegetarians or vegans. So um, if, if you're a happy vegetarian or vegan and you want to eat beans, nuts, legumes, awesome, continue to do it. Um, I think clean meat is really about the... 98% of Americans and people around the globe that aren't vegetarian, that don't want to become vegetarian, that want to continue to eat meat. So, I mean, that's kind of my take on it. Um, I, I'm not here to try to convince vegans to, to eat it. Um, I, 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 I want meat eaters to, to eat it, yeah. Thank you everyone so much for spending your afternoon with me.